Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the time that you've given us to come together and, and study your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and in knowledge of you, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com, and uh, this should be the Wednesday night uh, video, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, First Peter chapter, or I'm sorry, Second. Okay, scrub that. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So aware of our limitations, so thankful that you are our one teacher, so grateful for the time that you've given us to come together to feast upon your word together. I ask that you filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, but just seal to our hearts only that which is truth that we may grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 1 uh, with a focus particularly on verse 16. If we begin at the the beginning of the first chapter of Second Peter, and begin reading Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them, that's to us, that have obtained like precious faith with us, have obtained through the righteousness of God in our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And though that is just two verses, that's the first two verses of the chapter, and you could spend at least a hundred videos on those two verses alone. Of course, uh, we're not going to do that, but I'm... I'm hoping to be able to point out as we go down through this chapter just how corrupt and adulterated today's message is concerning believers in Christ, their position in Him, how they came to uh, partake of that grace, and what God, how God expects us to, to live and walk according to those principles that he lays out in the first chapter of Second Peter. I've watched a lot of, of videos on YouTube where the other uh, Bible teachers uh, tend to focus on some particular person's ministry or message and there it seems like as if their entire uh, ministry is sort of built around uh, exposing the falsehoods the lies the the error of other bible teachers now of course i decided a long time ago that i was not going to do that and here's the reason why It is not individual Bible teachers, individual persons that we are, I, I, in my opinion, that we are to focus on and to go after to try to expose the errors of their ministry. You could do the same thing with Blessed Hope Forever. There's no one has a handle on the truth. And so I'm just as, as capable of a of, being, of, sitting in judgment, passing judgment over others in their ministry as they are mine. 
what I believe is by far, far greater uh, of importance is the fact that what, that we understand that what we are uh, preaching, if we are preaching the truth of the, of the Word of God, then what we are doing is exposing the error of a system, not a person. Not some particular pastor or evangelist or some particular YouTuber or some particular believer who has some opinion uh, about this chapter, uh, first chapter of Second Peter, or any other chapter in the Bible. That's not what the Word of God does. We, we don't have chapters and verses of, of divinely inspired Scripture that, that really come out and attack or tear down or expose, try to expose the error of the ministry of other particular individuals. What we have from the Holy Spirit is divine revelation that pertains primarily to our the truth of God's Word exposing the falsehoods of a religious system, a, a complete system that has taken and departed from the truth of God's Word. We have, according to the text, we have obtained a like precious faith. It is my faith, is the, the faith that I have uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ, that being a gift, is not the same. Uh, when we're talking about our personal faith in Christ, uh, you know, I trust, I may trust God in some area of my life in which you may not, and vice versa. The faith that this is, uh, this particular context, this particular passage is talking about, is a like precious faith that we have all received through the righteousness of God. We haven't achieved that faith on our own. We haven't mustered up that faith on our own. We haven't, um, uh, we haven't established ourselves in any, any kind of faith on our own. It was through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When Christ died on the cross and he rose from the dead, we were justified, made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we stand before God as fully righteous, as fully righteous as His Son. We, we began our journey as a Christian. We started out on the basis of our being complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. That's how we started out. But something happened. Something happened that caused us a lot of upset. Something happened to cause us to take our eyes off of what Christ had done and place our entire attention on what we must do if God is to ever do anything. What you won't, won't find in this chapter is that the, the idea that, that we must do something for all of this to become effective in our lives. For this to be true of us, we must do something. You won't see that. You just don't see that. This is a love letter to God's people. And he says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That's how it's multiplied. It's not multiplied this grace and peace is not multiplied by any anything that we do on our part. According as His divine power, His divine power hath given unto us all things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, either God lied, which we know He didn't, or His divine power has given unto us all, all things, that pertain unto life and godliness. It's, it was done. Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. 
We didn't call ourselves. He called us. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. That's not you might become a Christian. That's you might be, become partakers of the divine nature. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Why are they so great? And why are they so precious? It's because it's by these that we become partakers of the divine nature. You know, how a person, a believer in Christ, matures as a Christian, how he matures and grows in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ is, is a very sensitive, very comprehensive subject that has nothing to do whatsoever with any effort on the part of the Christian. The Christian today, in the main, typically believes that he is responsible for his own growth, that he's responsible somehow for becoming partakers of the divine nature. If he just, you know, dots all his I's, crosses all his T's, if he does everything right, if he obeys every word of, of every, every instruction in the word of God, if he does, if he does, if he steps up to the bat and he does everything that God, they believe God requires uh, of them, then they become partakers of the divine nature. It is through his promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. And the alarming fact of the matter is, is that many a Christian today is completely unaware of God's promises. Or he doesn't really focus on God's promises. It's, he doesn't go set about to go and find out what God's promises concerning him are. Not really. Not at all. The, the, the mindset of the flesh is, to, is to, to go about our lives as a Christian and try and learn more and more and more about, about some method, some formula, some, some aspect, some venue, some, some way, some method of trying to perform as a Christian, and it's all based on uh, this world system, this religious system of human merit that God rewards those who try and he doesn't reward those who don't. There's really not a whole lot of trying when it comes to trusting God concerning his promises. I think it's a wonderful, beautiful thing that God would take and allow us to become partakers of his nature, the divine nature, to where that we grow in grace and knowledge of Christ and we become more and more like Jesus Christ through these promises that he's given us. And he's given us a lot of promises. He's given, in fact, he's given us so many promises that if all we focused upon was those, were, were those promises, we wouldn't have time to focus on ourselves or anything else. I've often stated in times past, I've, on numerous occasions, I've said, if all we ever did was thank God for all that he's done in our lives, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. We wouldn't have time to focus on the flesh. We have escaped that corruption. The letter, folks, is is laying out a, the, the position of the believer in Christ which has received blessings from God that were divinely... Uh, these are divine blessings. These are supernatural blessings divine blessings that God bestowed upon us by grace which lead to, which result in a life that's well-pleasing to God. It is not, your life is, 
is not well pleasing to God if you're going about striving to attain to some position it, it, uh, of which he's already established you. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Well, that seems like a lot of work until you look at, at that at, for what it's really saying here. These are based upon God's promises whereby we become partakers of the divine nature. I've often stated this, that, that the one thing that God desires, I believe, more than anything of us is that we trust Him. Trust Him how? Con concerning His promises. Because it's by these promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. The Christian life is a tough walk. It's a lonely walk. It is, it is hard. It is difficult in the sense of keeping our focus in the right direction. On Him and not ourselves. That's what makes it tough. Because we're naturally inclined to, to filter everything through the human mind, human rational uh, rationale, reasoning, human logic, you know, what feels good, what feels right, uh, what I think is true, rather than the promises of the Word of God. It is through these promises that, that, that diligence is established. It's through these promises of God that our faith is established. It's, it's through these promises of God that temperance and patience and godliness surfaces in our daily walk. These aren't things to do in order to become, uh, uh, they're certainly not things that we do to, in order to become a child of God. We, it started out, the, the verse, in verse, first, verse 1, it, we have obtained like precious faith, this is what we've done, to them who have obtained like precious faith. And you're not going to convince me that you somehow obtained that like precious faith on your own. The, the text won't allow you to say that. Grace and peace. Why does the Holy Spirit often combine, couple, grace and peace together? Well, because grace brings peace. Law certainly doesn't. All the law does is condemn. All the law does is point out, you know, your faults, your failures, your, your shortcomings, the law is, is, is very demanding, but we are not under law as a rule of life. We are under grace. It is grace that leads to godliness, brotherly kindness, brother, charity, you know, love. That's, grace does that. Law doesn't. And if these things be in you, says verse 8, and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind. If you're a Christian walking around and using the word grace loosely, not really understanding what the, the grace of God is, then this verse is describing you. You're blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Dearly beloved, the text could not be more clear. If you are living under this dark cloud of, oh, I don't know, condemnation, a guilt, uh, when you know, no guilt. No guilt, the, the, Christian, his, the Christian's life is, we are free from guilt. There is no guilt in the Christian's life. We only have one who accuses us, and that is Satan. He stands before God day and night accusing the brethren. God does not put guilt on you at all, uh, and particularly when it comes to the matter of sin. The sin issue was completely dealt with at the cross, you stand before God, 
holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. And if these things be in you and they abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and can't see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. How many Christians do you know who walk around with the idea in their minds that the sin issue really has not been settled between me and God, between them and God? You know, I, we still sin, and God hates sin, and, and he sees me sin, and and therefore, his attitude toward me has changed because I sinned. Dearly beloved, God's attitude does not change towards you because you sin. I'm sorry. It, I, it, you may want it that way, but that's not how that works. The sin issue was forever settled in our Lord Jesus Christ. God has nothing against you as a Christian. If you are a child of God, God has nothing against you at all. You're his child. The sin issue has been completely settled in the, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the only one that accuses you is Satan or his messengers. There's no guilt. There's no place for guilt. All guilt, all condemnation is of our enemy. It's not of God. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to... There's the rather. And then there's another way here. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Well, that sure certainly, Steve, that certainly sounds like that I better get with it. I better, I got to get with the program here. If I'm going to make sure of my calling and election, then there's got to be something I must do. Folks, you've turned it around. To make your calling and election sure is to, to examine your life, to make to, to make sure that it your life is not one, uh, your walk, your relationship with God is not one in which you're trying to, to earn God's unmerited favor. That is not going to make your calling and election sure. What's going to make your calling and election sure is resting in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He gave his, his body, his flesh, he gave his blood, his flesh and his blood, we take communion, we drink, we eat of the bread, we take of the, uh, partake of the wine, we, we come and we, it's the Lord's Supper, we feast on Christ, what he did, his person, his work, his flesh, his blood, his person, his work. That's what we do, and we make our calling and election sure by living as who God's made us. You know, it, it, it never ceases to astound me how that, I, we could, I could give a, a thousand examples, you know, of how something is, is one thing, but it doesn't know it's that thing, and so it goes about trying to become that thing when it's really already that thing. There's an, I have said this for so long, there is an identity crisis among Christians today that permeate, basically permeates the entire institution of modern day Christian evangelism, Christian service. You have been purged from your old sins. Your old sins. Well, Steve, that's just all those in the past. Dearly beloved, if 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 your sins were not fully, completely paid for, past, present, future, if that doesn't motivate you, t dearly beloved, if that, if that's not, if love, if the love of God and the forgiveness of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, if that does not motivate you to walk worthy of your calling, nothing will. 
Nothing will. Law certainly won't. And if you do these things, you will never fall. Why, was it, why does it say you'll never fall? Well, because how could you possibly fall under grace? For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Steve, I've heard this so much, I'm tired of hearing it. You know, every video you do, it's just all about grace. It's all about what Christ did. It's all about, you know, our sins have all, all been forgiven. We're, we're living under grace. We're not under law. You know, you can, you can, you can, you know, it's, it's really is, it's kind of the same old story, okay? And we, get, and we get accustomed to that, and we get used to that. And, you know, we, we tend to think, why do we need to continue to remind one another of these basic elementary principles of doctrines of Christ? Well, because we so easily forget. All it takes is one little mishap, one little catastrophe in our lives to take and turn us around, turn us our minds upside down, to where that we're not thinking correctly. Verses 12 and, uh, and 15 talk about putting one another in remembrance of these things. Obviously, the Holy Spirit considers it important that we keep reminding ourselves and one another of these things. And we come to verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, cleverly devised myths, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his, ma his majesty. So I want to talk a little bit about cunningly devised fables. Cleverly devised fables. Fables that were cleverly devised. And I do not think that man devised these fables. I do not think that for one second. I think man, in, for the most part, has fallen into the trap that was set by these cleverly devised fables. But man didn't invent them. Man didn't come up with them. I don't think he's that smart. I think our enemy has. And he's duped a whole lot of Christians into believing things that are just not true. They're just fables. They're myths. And I want to just cover a few. I can't cover many in, in just one video, but I just want to talk about a few. Let's just start at the top. Okay. Cleverly devised fables. Well, you have to do something. God's done his part. Now it's the rest is up to you, and he's waiting on you to respond to something that he's that he said. You've got to do something. You you have your work cut out for you here. You've got to do something in order to for what God has said is true of you to become effective in your life. Cleverly devised fable. The Bible doesn't say that. The text doesn't say that. You won't find a single verse in the entire New Testament that says that you must do something in order to be redeemed, or that you did do something in order to be redeemed. That God was powerless, he couldn't act until you acted first, and I've preached over 600 videos on this. No way, no way, no how did that happen. And Christians are confused about that. They somehow think that they, they look at that as, as a cause and effect sort of a situation. Well, it was cause and effect, but, it, but they reversed the cause and effect. It's not that that, well, it's not really that God did something, okay, which then prompted me to do something because of what God did. It was a natural outflow, a natural result of the work that God did in my life. Oh, we don't want to, we don't want to think of it that way. No, it can't possibly be that way. It has to be the other way around. That it was, it was our will, our desire, our work, our faith, our, our, our. It's just all about me. Me, 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 me. I had to do something in order for God to do something. Or, or whatever he had done for all, all, all of his people, it, it would only become effective when 
I made it effective by doing something uh, on my own. And folks, we we have put the, the the cart before the horse. Another cleverly devised fable is uh, is that I'm not totally depraved. I wasn't totally depraved. I wasn't really spiritually dead. There was there was some little spark of life in me, that little flame that if you just kind of fanned it, fanned the flame, you know, it would come alive and and it would be able to respond to God accordingly. Spiritually dead is spiritually dead. You were like Lazarus in the tomb, and Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. That's how it happened. You didn't you weren't you were not Lazarus in the tomb who made a decision to come forth. And of course, you know, Jesus couldn't raise Lazarus until Lazarus had made up his mind that that was what he was going to do, was come forth. It amazes me how Christians can actually turn the grace of God upside down and they, they, they tend to get along with that. doesn't seem to bother them at all. We want to turn it around, what, take what God did and put that at the bottom and put what we do at the top when it's the other way around. When it was God, God is at the top, we're underneath, we responded because God did something. And why not? Because we're His people. Because He's working in our lives. Because He called us. He chose us in Christ. Chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. By one offering, He has perfected forever them that are sanctified. We were called. We were chosen. We were predestined. Christians don't like these words because they, they don't fit into the modern day narrative of modern day evangelism and modern-day Christian service. They just don't fit the narrative. They're foreign to the narrative. Man just loves making stuff up. And a lot of that is a result of just poor study habits. You just don't study. You don't, you don't bother to really spend time in His Word to find out what God really did say concerning you and your identity and who you are as a Christian and what God has done for you. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. We just want to sort of make it up as we go along. Well, this is what, this seems rational. This seems logical. This seems, and folks, we're not dealing with human logic here. There was only one person, one person, verse 17, only one person that God ever said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we, he is pleased with us because we are in the one in whom he said he was pleased with. There is no possible way on earth if you lived to be, lived to be a million years old, there's no way that you could possibly even come anywhere near, anywhere close to what Christ accomplished on your behalf. But you want to spend your measly 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 20 years trying to do that. Uh, we just want to be like Christ. We want to live like Christ. We want to do our, he's, he was our example, and we are to follow that example. That's the typical mindset today. Folks, Christ is not your example. He's your life. The, the fact of the matter is, what the truth of it is that it's not I, but Christ. There are a lot of cleverly devised fables. A lot of them. Well, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So I shouldn't eat, eat this, and I shouldn't smoke that, and I shouldn't drink that, and I shouldn't... Now, wait a minute. You, you are not a temple... Of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I hate using the word ghost. Ghost implies a disembodied spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. You're looking at the King James ghost. Uh, used to scare me as a kid when I, I'd read. I never felt right about that. He, it's not Holy Ghost. It's Holy Spirit. So you are a temple of the, of the Holy Ghost. You're a temple. Your body is a temple. 
Your physical body is a temple. And that's not what it says. You, it's What the text is saying is you are a member of Christ's body. Um, one member, which is his body is made up of many members. You are one member, a member of that one singular temple, the body of Christ, which is the church on earth. We, the church, are the temple. You are not a temple. You're not a temple, and, and I'm not a temple, and this guy's not a temple, and this guy, gal over here, she's a temple, and so we're just all a bunch of little temples running around. And that is not what the text says at all. But, but modern evangelism, modern, modern Christianity, modern Christian teaching, your typical teaching today, is, is that you are a temple. Your body's a temple. And why would they push that, that, that false no idea? Well, because it's, it, it's, it's, the perfect, uh, it's the perfect verse to, to use to try to support the fact that you're under law, not grace. In, in fact, it, the very suggestion that, that you are a temple, that your body is a temple, and therefore you shouldn't do anything bad to it, or you should, you know, it should be as clean and pure as possible. That's that just leads to law. So that's another cleverly devised fable. Satan has done everything he can to take and turn this text upside down to where that you look at it, where it's all about you, and it's not about him at all. At all, he's just sort of a a bystander, you know, that he's he's looking down and he's maybe he's. I don't know, he's, he's, he's chewed his fingernails down to the quick, he worried to death over whether or not you're going you're gonna to act right, whether you're going to accept him, receive him, or believe in him. Uh, he just wishes you will. I hope he does. You know, I've done all I can do. Now the rest is up to them. And, and folks, if that's the God that you see in this book, you haven't spent much time in this book. He came into this world to save his people from their sins. Did he do that? Is he doing that? Or has he left it up to man? I think I've done other videos in the past on cleverly devised fables. Folks, that you could write books, you could write volumes on the cleverly devised fables. But, but some of the major cleverly devised fables that are going around in the year 2023, you know, 2,000 years since Christ was here, are so upsetting that it makes it, it makes it difficult to see, actual see the, actually see the truth of what God has said. Because the world has written its narrative and the truth doesn't seem to fit into that narrative. And so, the result of that is the Word of God is, is adulterated, it's, it's twisted, it's perverted, it's turned upside down, it's turned around and backwards. It's misinterpreted in, in such a way as to where that it's all now filtered all through your, your power, your ability, your response, your dedication, your devotion, all those you know, I can continue listing, you know, you know, it's all about you. The only reason that you believe is because of him. The only reason that you received anything is because of him. The only reason that you do anything as far as the Christian's life is concerned, the only reason you pray study your Bible, go to church. The only, only reason that you do any of that is because of Him, of what He's done. It's certainly not going to earn you any, any entrance into heaven. I have a text here that says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Verse 11 is really the verse I was looking for. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's if we make our calling and election sure. For if you do these things, if you do these things. Now, folks, I, I admit, now just please go, go to verse 10 and look at it. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I don't know how many Christians will read that and say, well, see, Steve, it says that if we do all these things, then an entrance shall be ministered unto us abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's not what it's saying. I'd love to spend more time on this chapter. I really would, but uh, it's back to 2 Corinthians uh, this Sunday. Uh, maybe we can come back here next Wednesday. I'll be praying about that and thinking about it. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Uh, thank you so much for all of your uh, prayers for this ministry, the direction of this ministry. I pray for you all constantly. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.